Today is the 21st of July, 2015, and our topic is the Iranian-Iraqi War, which broke out in September of 1980 and lasted until August of 1988. My guest is Dave DeWitt of the Athens News. I am Robert Whaley, retired historian at Ohio University, and this is the Athens Speakout number 300. And 39. I would like to review the four or five top cabinet officials and the chief of staff of Ronald Reagan, the 40th president, who was the greatest propagandist of all of the presidents in the history of the United States. He gave himself the title of the great communicator. Now, I think that's phony. The telegraph company and the telephone company and the radio companies invented the system of communications, which was a neutral wire. And the speakers on both ends had their own political points of view. So, just exactly what was the ideology that Ronald Reagan was trying to communicate to the American people. And it was a very simple ideology, which he discovered in 1947 when he was a movie actor and was working for J. Edgar Hoover. It was that communism was the greatest threat to American society. It's very, very simplistic. The problem is, how do you define the various strands of communism, and what do you do about it? Do you just give speeches about bad communism, or do you have a solution to the challenges of real politicians like Joseph Stalin or Leonid Brezhnev, who became the inheritor of Soviet power when Reagan got into office in 1980? So anyway, uh, according to the American Constitution, the purpose of the president is to enforce the laws of Congress, and the Congress, with its two houses, propose legislation at the request of the demands of the American people. And the voters have various interests. The voters are taxpayers, farmers, merchants, bankers, blacks, whites, uh, Protestants, Catholics, Jews, and they all see the world through a different point of view if we believe in the American Constitution that each, each individual voter will decide with his own free conscience who should be the president, and who should be his senator, who should be his governor, and who should be the representatives. Well, from 1776 to 1790, when the American Constitution was established, uh, most of the uh, professions were a few bankers, but many, many lawyers, lots of ministers, Lots of Protestant ministers were the major professions who graduated from college, we'll say, in 1790 when George Washington was inaugurated. And the Secretary of State that George Washington appointed was a lawyer, Thomas Jefferson. And Alexander Hamilton, his Secretary of Treasury, was a banker. And the attorney general was also a lawyer. And the War Department that uh, George Washington set up had a civilian lawyer who hired uh, a few volunteer generals to become the uh, professional army for any future war. But George Washington saw the War Department as in charge and the military 
are a small group of professionals who volunteer in times of war and return like George Washington did himself to his farming life. Now the Supreme Court had uh, nine professional lawyers and their duty was to interpret the law. So we have three branches of government and then we have a federal system in which the 13 colonies uh, had governors and representatives who represented uh, the different economic parts of the country. And uh, so the United States has a divided government from the very beginning. But in, in 20th century times, by the time uh, Ronald Reagan became president, uh, the president's power was increasing tremendously and the rights of the citizens and the rights of the states uh, or in decline. Now, if we fast forward from Washington to uh, Truman, who became president on the death of Franklin Roosevelt, uh, Truman had trouble finding a secretary of state. Uh, the army, the war department, was expanded with the Navy department, the Marine department, the Air Force, and the CIA, and the vast Pentagon set up a five power office with three military or five military branches. And the first Secretary of Defense was James V. Forrestal. And Eisenhower, who uh, was the 34th president in 1960, called this Pentagon the military industrial complex. And the power of the military uh, industrial complex. Uh, increased tremendously by the time uh, Ronald Reagan took over in uh, 1980. So, uh, do you want to name some of the important top cabinet officials that Reagan installed in power in 1980? Well, I figured that we'd uh, just go through the Quick. the big the yeah. big four, you know. Yeah, the big four. War, yeah. Treasury. Yeah, that's right. State, right. Attorney General, um, the the well, his first Secretary of State was Alexander Haig, right. But he didn't last very long. That's only right. Only a, a little bit over a year. He was replaced by George Shultz, who right. had a big impact, right, um, on the administration. The Secretary of Defense um, was Casper, which, which, Casper, Casper Weinberger. Casper Weinberger. Um, I, I only hesitated there because I, I, it always makes me laugh thinking about the Secretary of Defense instead of the Secretary of War or the well, War Department a, instead of the Defense Department. That was a, trick, that was a department. trick of Truman. Right. It was peace propaganda. Right. But the, the government was more honest from Washington to Franklin Roosevelt. And they called it the War Department. Right. It was the Secretary of War. Right. Now and of course that came from the old British War Office. Right. And the State Department was the British Foreign Office. Mm -hmm. So they had a Home Office, which is the Attorney General, the War Office, and the Colonial Office. They, they had four departments which were named for what they really did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> isn't that, isn't that so unique? So the, the, <laughs> the uh, uh, Truman administration and all the way up to Ronald Reagan when, and beyond so when are Truman, getting into propaganda. When Truman gave us the empire and the military industrial complex, he also gave us the rhetoric to go with it. As part of it. He started The Defense the, Department. Yeah, anyway, yeah. I don't want to get sidetracked. Yeah, that's uh, good. Secretary of the Treasury, Donald Reagan. Yep. And, um, and... He had multiple attorney generals as well, but the one that I think is significant, um, who also played uh, other roles in the administration well, before attorney general. Well, wasn't Casper Weinberger more important than Reagan? Oh, I think so. Reagan was the, the monetary policy. Okay. As far as what we're going to discuss with foreign policy, okay. absolutely Casper Weinberger was yeah, right. much more important. Edwin Meese was the other one that I wanted to mention. Yeah. Not to mention uh, Chief of Staff. James now, he Baker. He's very important. Very important, yes. What did he do? Who was he? James Baker was, well, he had actually worked on George H.W. Bush's campaign right. in the right. primary as right. an opponent of Reagan. Um, right. in and the then, beginning. In the beginning. But then he became Reagan's chief of staff. 
Because, and because Vice President, uh, because George, George Bush became, became the vice, vice president, president. And there was a compromise between Texas and California. Mm -hmm. This is a solid Republican administration. Right. The oil and the propaganda were all behind this super powerful Republican administration. Yeah. But Baker did, and Baker did grow to have a, a significant influence in the Reagan administration. Sure. The chief of staff position generally is considered or thought of as the gatekeeper right. to the president position. Right. Controls access. Yeah. Well, to the in president. Roosevelt's day, the chief of staff did exactly what Roosevelt said. Right. And that was true in Johnson's day. Mm -hmm. But Reagan was largely a figurehead mm -hmm. and delegated all of this power to these guys, okay? And so you can see how Baker... Yeah. And all Reagan had to do was influence. to give a, a two-minute speech uh, every day about how bad communism was. And the mass media would publicize this as the great communication of the day. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, now, what about uh, William Casey? William and Casey. And CIA. William Casey was Reagan's, uh, well, I think he was, what, his campaign manager first, and then he was yeah. appointed director of the CIA. And right. this is following, if you remember our earlier episodes, following right. Carter's reduction of right. the espionage in the CIA. Uh, Casey, under Reagan, led a re-expansion of the CIA to Correct. much bigger heights than it was even before right. Carter. Uh, oh, so, yeah. yeah right. So the, this is when the CIA really got into... Uh, big money. Yeah, big money and, and big, big action big on, the, on yeah. the world stage. Especially yeah. in the Middle East. Right. Yeah, okay. I think that's pretty good. Uh, you want to say any more about propaganda? Do you, do, do you, do you know who Gene Kirkpatrick is? Gene Kirkpatrick was a... Uh, um, uh, the U.S. ambassador to the United Nations yes. under Reagan, right? And what is her job? She well, she was an ardent anti-communist, right? And, and so she, gave she the was same a propagandist to the General Assembly, right? Um, she had a little more flexibility. Yeah, it wasn't just <laughs> it wasn't just the simplistic views of of. Uh, yeah, human events, it, human events, and J. Edgar Hoover. Right. Yeah, and she, she even became no. It became known as the Kirkpatrick Doctrine. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which was and she the was U.S. support Democrat. of anti-communist government all the way until 1985. I discovered in yeah, my research, yeah. she it was, was Nixon who recruited her. Mm -hmm. And that's the beginning of the neoconservatives. Yeah. Well, well, well the beginning, yeah. expansion of it. Yeah, an expansion after Podhoretz and the others yeah, kind yeah, of yeah, led yeah, the yeah. way initially in the 70s yeah, in right. a re as a reaction to Carter, really. Right. So, so she was quite an important asset to the Reagan administration on the neoconservative, so, right. which, which what, brought, in the, brought in the conservative Jews who were anti-communist for a different reason. Yeah, yeah. The and all the anti-communists were, were Protestants and Catholics. The new ones are these neoconservatives. <laughs> right. And I, what I find significant about the Kirkpatrick Doctrine is the willingness under this idea of anti-communism to support authoritarian dictatorships sure. as long as they followed the Washington-Reagan administration line of anti-communism. Sure, right. So it wasn't a pro-democracy doctrine. No, no. It was purely anti-communist. Right. Or they had a lip service for democracy in the early days, which was good for television. Well, yeah, it, it <laughs> sets the heart aflutter. But, but, but. but if you are a, a sophisticated journalist, you have to learn to read between the lines. Absolutely. And uh, t television, unfortunately, just published the lines without comment, for the most part. But we Publisher had, blur. Yeah, yeah, but we have the Nation magazine. We have the... Uh, uh, New York Review of Books, the London Review of Books, and academia, you know, Harvard, Yale, uh, Berkeley, these people didn't vote for Ronald Reagan. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. I was a critic before you even started. Well, anyway, I think we can get into the key.
political question. Did the CIA prolong the Iranian-Iraqi war which broke out in September of 1980? Do you want oh, to? Oh, absolutely. You prolong it? it? Uh, they, not only did they prolong it, they encouraged its beginning. The uh, uh, United States policy um, changed drastically with regard toward Saddam Hussein and Iraq yeah. in the well, early look, the 80s. Well, the point is that this is all interpretation. Yeah. I don't think you and I have the documents from the CIA or the Defense Department. No, we have, but we have the quotes of people like we've talked about before, like Gary Sick. Yeah, and well, Gary Zabigu Sick is a Brzezinski. critic. Yeah, well, Brzezinski is in the middle. In Brzezinski's own words, though, he, he, I, he began... To look more, he said that even under Carter, as early as Carter, right. he began to look more favorably towards Saddam Hussein as a potential counterweight to the Ayatollah Khomeini, uh, that's, and as a force to contain Soviet expansion in the region. Yeah, um, right. Gary Sick. Do you, puts have a it, do you have a date for that Zabrinsky? That quote? Um, no, I think that came from his uh, one of his memoirs. Yeah, well, that's after it's over. Yeah, he can look back upon it and justify it. And here's here's six version looking back on it as yeah, well. Right, he wasn't talking at the time, but he speaking about Brzezinski. He says Brzezinski was letting Saddam assume that there was a U.S. green light for his invasion of Iran because there was no explicit red light. Yeah, so. He, what Six says is, to say the U.S. planned and plotted it all out in advance is simply not true. Saddam had his own reasons for invading Iran, and they were sufficient. So Saddam was under the impression, the U.S. isn't going to stop me. That's right. They're fine hanging right. back on this one, right. so I'm going to go ahead and go right. forward. And I think as he went forward, the U.S., under the CIA's involvement, became much more. Well, let's, let's look at the map. Let's look at map one. Uh, map one is a relationship between the huge Iran, this yellow state, and uh, the pink state uh, with the two blue lines, the Tigris-Euphrates Valley, and you might see there's a little red state down here in the corner. That's Kuwait. And these two rivers empty into the Persian Gulf. And Iran's oil is at the Abidjan refinery, right mm -hmm. down there on the mouth of the two rivers, and right across uh, Iran, over on the Iraqi side, on the pink side, there is a town called Basra. And here we have a second map, which shows you this uh, delta a little, a, little, a little clearer here. We have the yellow Iran, and we have a white Iraq, and we have this little town of Basra on the Iraqi side of the border, and right over here there's a little A for the Abaddon refinery. And then we have Kuwait. Now Kuwait was an independent state established by the British back in 1902. And this is just for the clarification of the people watching, this is all in the bottom right-hand corner of the map. Yeah, right, right. I'm sorry about that. So uh, Kuwait is down here, and then we have the blue, the blue border is Iraq. And uh, this, this is the, the basis of the war, because when Saddam Hussein attacked, he attacks through the Basra base, and he's, he's thinking maybe he can get- aiming for the refinery. Yeah, maybe he can get to the refinery. This refinery, to put that in context, is one of the largest oil refineries in the world. Yeah, established in 1909 right. by the British-Iranian Oil Company, which later became the British Petroleum Company. BP, as yeah. we know it. And this was the monopoly for the British fleet, and that was needed for the First World War. Right. And Iraq, no, Iran became a kind of a British satellite, and Kuwait was a second satellite protected by the British Empire because of the mouth of those tigers. And they could always play Pollock. The British could play one emir against the Shah or the Shah against yeah. the Ottoman Empire. The Ottoman Empire owned Iraq before mm -hmm. the First World War. 
Before, and that's when the Ottoman Empire broke up. Yeah, and then the British, through the League of Nations, Winston Churchill became the colonial minister. And he set up a mandate in Palestine under the British flag, and a mandate in Jordan under the British flag, and a mandate in Iraq. And they invented a new state called Iraq. But it was the old Mesopotamia. Mm -hmm. And the Iraq government then uh, was more or less influenced up until the Second World War by the British. Mm -hmm. And now uh, the British oil empire is being threatened by various terrorist groups inside Iran and Iraq. Okay. So if we look at this uh, balance of power here, it's rather odd that this war begins in September of 1980, when Carter was still in office. Yes, but two I, months before the election. Yeah, I don't think Carter initiated that. I think no. that was done through the CIA and Brzezinski. Mm -hmm. They could see that I Carter was going to be defeated. Yeah. And Brzezinski encouraging it along. Right. And Brzezinski did secure for himself a role in the Reagan administration. Yeah, that's as right. Well. He was promoted. And they started this with Operation Cyclone. Right, Cyclone. Yeah, this was against the Soviets infiltrating into Afghanistan. And uh, Carter then was convinced to give a few million dollars for the first year. But it was Reagan that escalated all the way to 87 until the Soviets finally gave up and went home. But at the cost of another $2 billion for the American taxpayer. Yeah. And then the Americans inherit the whole Afghan problem. Who controls Afghanistan? Pakistan? Uh, oh, at that time, yeah. <laughs> the terrorists? The Taliban? <laughs> Yeah, and Afghanistan is a very so these tribal wars these nation. wars be, uh, a backfire. Well, anyway, to get back to 1980, Iran has a population of 54 million people. Iraq only has 17 million. That's a population ratio of three to one. And then when we look at the GDP, it's four to one in favor of Iran. 180 billion dollars. GDP versus $44 billion for Iraq. So why would this little military state of Saddam Hussein dare attack Iran? Well, he overestimated his own army. And yeah. he thought that because of the Iranian Revolution. He saw, we, he saw that, an opportunity. That Ayatollah is, is confused. He thought that he could take advantage of the chaos because uh, of the re apparently, revolution. Apparently, Saddam, Brzezinski and the about. CIA encouraged that myth. <laughs> I, yeah. I'm sure they did. <laughs> apparently. Anyway, I can't prove it, but it sounds good. Well, anyway. Um... Uh, I guess we've covered. Oh, I want to say one more point about this map too. Uh, this map too, way up in the north, you have the little town of Mosul. Now, Mosul was the center of an oil well, and the British back in 1920s, when they were fighting with the French about the mandates, and the French got Syria and Lebanon, and the French were originally angling for Iraq too, but the British said, okay, we'll take the military jurisdiction in Baghdad, but we'll give the Iraq oil company privileges for the French. So the French got the oil all during the 20s and the 30s from these Mosul fields. Up now, north. Mosul is back in the news because this is where the new Isius is capturing the fields and taking the oil right. and financing the revolution. In northern Iraq. In northern yes. Iraq. So the two oil fields are Basra, a Shiite territory, and a uh, Sunni territory up here near the Kurdish territory. I was wondering, so that's Sunni, not Kurdish yeah, territory, that's Sunni before, up there. before ISIS yeah. took it over, or right. as I call them, Daesh. Yeah. Well, Daesh is their name. 
Yeah, well, it's an insulting <laughs> name in the Middle East, and so that's why I use it. Yeah, yeah, well, okay, it's probably more accurate, but they call themselves the Caliphate. Right. And the Americans don't want to give the Caliphate much publicity. But there are lots of volunteer terrorists there who, are. Th who think that well, the Caliphate can come back. Well, that's how they actually, the, the a lot of the leadership of Daesh slash ISIS is made up of former Ba'athist officials under right. Saddam Hussein. Right. And they hang back and do the orchestrating while they take all the volunteers and send them off to actually do the Okay, play. so uh, I guess we're ready for a new question now, unless you have a... No, uh, go ahead. And the new question is, as of January 1981, what did Ronald Reagan say about this complex history of the Middle East throughout this first years of this war. Well, are you, what did, was his opinion on Iraq, Iran, or the oh, Middle East in oh, general? Well, no, this war. We have to just focus <clears throat> on this war. There's the Anglo, uh, the, the Iranian-Iraqi war breaks out in 1980, 81, 82, and it's getting worse. Mm -hmm. And then, see, I, you're going to have to, I've, I've read some of his, position, his speeches on the Middle East in general, uh, where he talks about peace in the Middle East yeah. is our moral imperative. Yeah, this is all Israeli propaganda. And that's all, yeah, <laughs> that's all Israel-Palestine stuff. Yeah. Well, actually, he says very little. He does, yeah. That's the, I had a hard time coming that's, up that's with That's the Reagan. communist rhetoric. Yeah, I he had a hard time. He doesn't talk about that, the, the concrete realities of, of the military. You I, know, I, that's I couldn't all come delegated. up with much. No, I, neither could I. Uh, but that's an interesting observation. Okay, so neither the mass media nor Ronald Reagan ever said much about this war. This war was left off the media. And it was only cranks like myself <laughs> who bothered to follow this yeah. because I could see this would lead to trouble. It would not lead to any, any American victory. The United States was sinking deeper into the desert following the Vietnam pattern, thinking that the American military can control and that's, developed countries. It's that, just absurd. That's notable that it's very, it's highly notable that this wasn't covered much in the media back then because if you think of Iraq and Iran and Afghanistan, all three of those countries had war going on that's at right. the same time throughout most of the 80s there. That's a large swath of, you yeah. know, Southwest Asia slash the Middle East. That's right. To be going through wartime. Right. And not having yeah. people pay too much attention to yeah. it. Well, this was all under the CIA, and nobody was paying any attention. And the Saudis and the uh, Pakistanis are doing the fighting. In uh -huh. Iraq. Yeah, right. The Amer Americans didn't have to send any troops. I think there are only 10 CIA agents Is from the United all? States that went to Afghanistan. This was all what they call a proxy war. Mm -hmm. Let the Muslims kill each other off. And this is Ronald Reagan's policy of peace. We're protecting Israel. <laughs> yeah. Israel's not losing by this. <laughs> so anyway, uh, the Khomeini government is Shia, and the Saddam Hussein government is Sunni, and that brings back old historic prejudices in all of the imams in these two states. And according to Saddam Hussein, he has his own analysis of this war. Saddam Hussein says that the bilateral be war began back in July of 79 when there were Shia agents from Iran, the revolutionary government, infiltrating into Iraq. And he was counterattacking in order to stop these Shia, to order to protect his empire, which was based on the Sunni northern part of Iraq. Oh, see? I see what, so that's yeah, what he was claiming. Yeah, that's what he claimed. He doesn't blame, he doesn't blame the CIA for this. He doesn't oh, know no, anything about Oh, no, he wouldn't. This. Yeah, and he doesn't know anything about it. He was eventually going to get a lot of weapons yeah, that's, and that's other, right. other right. support. Right, so Syria then cuts off Iraqi exports because the pipeline from Mosul goes up near the Turkish border through, through Syria. Into Syria. Yeah, and okay. Syria is sympathetic to Iran. So Iran has an ally 
the Alawite regime are closer to Sunnis. I mean Shia. Right. It's so a this it's is, a yeah. offshoot of Shia. Yeah, right. A little faction of it, see. So Which both is why Iran so both sides to support them. are uh, using American weapons in Baghdad and Tehran, and they're using uh, U.S. Air Force and U.S. Navy equipment sold for cash to both sides. They're not losing any money, <laughs> <laughs> and they all claim that they're going to win. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, nobody needs a peace at this point. Now the Khomeini government does have some Shia guerrillas. Now if we look at that border again, uh, or if we imagine the border between Iran and Iraq, that border between the pink and the yellow is not an ethnic border. That's a military oh, no. border yeah. established way back in prehistoric times. And there are Shiite living in, in uh, on the Iraqi side. There are Arabs who are Shiite. Uh -huh. And there are uh, Arabs living on the Iranian side. So Sunni they, on the Sunnis yeah, in yeah, Iran. They could have exchanged population if they wanted peace. But Persian they, Sunnis? No, there are Arabs. Arab, ethnic Arab, Arabs who okay. live on the Iranian ethnic side. Arab. Okay. Yeah. Because these were all open deserts back under the Ottoman Empire. Right. The Ottomans didn't care anything about that border. Which creates, yeah. <laughs> and those cre things create the confu a lot of the confusion yeah. about the language we use to talk about the Middle East. Even yeah. the word the Middle East is a little bit... But that's a British invention. Right, because it's really Southwest Asia. Is what well, we're Southwest about. Asia is from the point of view of Pakistan. Right, yeah. okay. That's Pakistani thinking. Yeah. Uh, but, but my point is, I guess, like when we talk about Iraq, we talk about three different groups... Sunnis, Shiites, and Kurds. Well, Kurds, that's not a religion. The other two are religion. Kurds is a, a, a region Well, the Kurds, the Kurds are Iranian, uh, Indo-European language speakers, but they were Muslims. Right. They were created, they were converted to Islam centuries ago, okay? But they wanted their independence from Arabs. Because they're not a Arabs. They're not Arab because they're Persian. So you're talking about different ethnicities, but conflating it with right. religion. But, the, but it all gets the very Kurdish tribe messy very was quickly. split into three states. Some were living in Iran, some are living in British Iraq, and some are living in Syria. Well, the Kurds would like to unify this, mm -hmm. and they think Iraq should disappear. And that's what the Americans are playing on now. That, Kurdis, that uh, Kurdistan will become a, an it's independent an state. Independent state. But this is absolutely anathema to Turkey because the <laughs> Turks have a large Kurdish majority, right. or a big minority rather, in yeah. the eastern part of Turkey. So where do you get, how do you get from there so to the there? So the, balance of, of the balance of power in the Middle East is totally confused and the American military think they can exploit this. Yeah, they can for a short-term war, but what happens when they call for peace? They all end up more bitter, and they all say, okay, we're going to get rid of these Americans next time. Yeah. Should so we take nobody, a station, yeah, yeah, we, sorry, I'm, I'm glad you reminded us. Okay, well, while I'm battling on here, my name is Robert Whaley, retired historian. And we're arguing about or debating uh, about the complex Iranian-Iraqi war which broke out during the Reagan administration and lasted from 1980 to 88 when he retired. This and there's another interesting administration. clue. When, when he steps down, the war suddenly comes to an end. <laughs> I wonder why. Well, um, that had something to do with military <laughs> action. We'll get to that. We'll get to 88, why it ended yeah. rather suddenly. We but will. anyway, uh, we're only up to 82 now. And our, our guest is uh, Dave DeWitt, who is a uh, perceptive journalist who's picking up history on the job, so to speak. Uh, and we're talking about uh, the Reagan administration and this supposedly bilateral Iraqi war in which Reagan and the TV are not paying much attention to, but it's going to have a long-term uh, consequences. So let us look at the third map here.
a detailed map of the delta. Uh, here we are. This shows the delta of the Tigris-Euphrates Valley coming down. And this shows the city of Basra. Basra is the Shiite territory on the Iraqi side of the border. And then on the other side, you have Abaddon. And these rivers flow out in a delta. And due to the politics, the, uh, the uh, delta was favorable to the side of Iraq. The British mandate, when they set up Iraq, they had Kuwait. Oh, because they got most of the yeah, delta. And they had Basra on their side. And Abaddon was on the other side of the river. But it wasn't too far for the uh, armies of Saddam Hussein to kind of attack. But they didn't do much attacking. Mm -hmm. Because the British, the British were neutral in this game. Well, they, they sent out a signal to the CIA. You're not going to let them attack that refinery. So the oh, refinery yeah. was, was yeah, the, the refinery was left out. The British were silent during the whole war. They were really neutral. And the United States was playing neutrality. Mm -hmm. But were financing the weapons to keep the Muslims fighting each other. That's the interesting uh, important point of that map. So Kuwait was the little red-orange state, which was separately and independent. And they had their own little war in 1991. When, when Saddam Hussein decided to cut Kuwait off in order to get that delta, and he was getting revenge for his loss in this uh, 88 war. Okay. But then the Americans intervened on the side of Kuwait against Saddam Hussein. So the Americans changed sides. As Saddam Hussein wins, they don't let him win too much. They go on the other side, see. Mm -hmm. So the United States is playing a Machiavellian game here with the Arab peoples. Okay, let's look at Henry Kissinger. Have you discovered any evidence that Henry Kissinger was playing any kind of a role in this Iraq-Iranian war? I looked, I looked for evidence. I tried, uh, the first thing that I discovered was his famous line, his quip, it's too bad that they both can't lose. <laughs> um, <laughs> that was the first thing that comes up when you associate Well, I'm glad Kissinger's you discovered name. that. I, I didn't discover that. Yeah. That what, was would, do you have any idea of when, what year, uh, year that was? I, I, I think it was like 86 or 87. Somewhere. That's near the end. Yeah. Yeah. He was getting tired of the war now. He at must this have point. been. <laughs> um, I found it difficult to find dis direct associations with him yeah. to the war. So I don't know if you did found anything. No, no, no. You have to do a lot of research. Yeah. You've got to read his memoirs. And oh, I haven't read his memoirs. I haven't either. Yeah. But you see, he, uh, well, he was playing that with, uh, with, with uh, Carter. See, he made the treaty between Egypt and separated those from the Arab states. Mm -hmm. And that was a, a, a peace between Egypt and Israel. So as far as... Right, the Camp David Accords. Yeah, and as far as uh, uh, Kissinger's concerned, he retires because Carter is elected, and he's a Democrat, so he goes back to Georgetown. And he goes hasn't back got, to academia. If he gives any advice to Reagan... Or, or uh, uh, to the CIA, to um, Casey, Casey, or to uh, Alexander Haig. It's very quiet under the table because he didn't have to stick his neck out. Of course, Reagan yeah, and might he's fall too on his. smart to stick his yeah, neck so out he's, anyway. He's just playing peace now. But Israel wasn't losing in this war, and he didn't have to speak out for Israel. And Egypt wasn't losing, Egypt was neutral. They got that. They got their uh, part of the pie as a result of the uh, right. ceasefire agreement of, of seventy four. And the only and the only so I found in a, is, I found in a Reagan it. speech he cited the Camp David Accords as a framework, the yeah. only framework to work off of in the That's Middle right. East. But and then it was Jimmy Carter who couldn't capitalize on that. 
Yes. Because of the Iranian Revolution. Now, the Iranian Revolution was probably an accident, as far as uh, Kissinger is concerned. He I thought, don't think he didn't anticipate it. No, no, he thought the Shah would stay forever. Yeah. And when the Shah got sick, he said, well, "I got to save the Shah." But he didn't know what who the Ayatollah was. He just he have, didn't have to say anything at this point. So anyway, Henry Kissinger's memoirs. Briefly go over that. He has three volumes of memoirs. And the first memoir is the one I read. I read one third of that. And that, you might say, is the good Kissinger <laughs> from 1968 to 1974. If you insist, I. Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, Kissinger. We've talked about that. Kissinger got Nixon out of the quagmire in Vietnam. That's, that's and true. And Kissinger got Beijing admitted to the United Nations and said, if you're going to play the balance of power, yeah. you got to get out of... And that was savvy on his part. But I will note that the only reason Nixon was able to do that was because there wasn't a Nixon out there to Nixon him over it. You know? What does that mean exactly? It means that there wasn't, some, there wasn't somebody out there like Richard Nixon to criticize him for, for placating the Maoists. You know, no, I don't quite follow that. Because Nixon, Nixon, be, if, Nixon imagine if Johnson tried to do it uh, to open up to China. Could you imagine what Richard Nixon might have had to say oh, about that? At, you're looking at it from the point of view of the so-called opening the door to China. Right. Okay. So imagine if anybody else other than Richard Nixon did it while Nixon was still a political player. Imagine what he would have. Well, I, I don't imagine. That. I just look at the historical. The, I know that's my journalistic <laughs> speculation. Yeah, well, from the, from the point of view of of, um, of Nixon's thinking, he uses communism in order to tar the Democratic Party for quote losing China. Yeah, he was not concerned with the Middle East. Yeah. Oh no, no. Yeah. And he, he really wasn't. wasn't concerned about Vietnam. He inherited that war from, from the Korean War and Dean Acheson. So Nixon had to be the anti-communist when he first got involved in 68. But Rockefeller got after him and said, well, I'll only endorse you as president if you bring in this Jewish advisor, Henry Kissinger, who can get you out of Indochina. So, so, it's so Kissinger was a Rockefeller yes, Republican? Nixon, uh, uh, Kissinger worked for the Rockefeller dynasty before, before he Nixon. ever got into office. Mm -hmm. That goes back to the gold water. In other words, Kissinger's not an ideologue. No, he's a real politic. Yeah. Now, uh, Nixon has a little more sympathy to real politic, but it's very limited in scope. It's just to be anti-democratic, just mm -hmm. to use that Chiang Kai-shek, Dean Acheson, uh, Joe McCarthy, you guys lost China. But he wasn't thinking of the future. He was just thinking of his re-election. And he got re-elected yeah. by, by, by Kissinger. He wanted to get back into the game. And, and gradually, they played this odd couple. I told you about the odd couple. You have an anti-Semite president, and you have a pro-Jewish advisor who says to Nixon, be careful about Cambodia. Don't, don't get too deep into that, okay? Be careful about de-escalating this war. That's the de-escalation policy. The skies retreat. Yeah, you can be anti-communist on television, but I have to negotiate with no Dean Zim uh, and Lee Ducto and get out of it. Yeah. So, so Nixon is playing a double game and Kissinger is playing a different double game. The, when you said the odd couple, I just had to give a shout out to uh, some great, the, I think the best satirists of that odd couple, John Belushi and Dan Aykroyd on Saturday Night Live. Yeah. Playing kick, uh, Kissinger. Well, uh, Dave, Reagan, uh, uh, Robert Kissinger Dalek is a diplomatic historian. Mm -hmm. He's like the John Gaddis that used to be here. I met Dalek when he was working on his PhD. And he worked in UCLA, and he did presidential biographies. He started out with Roosevelt. He did Roosevelt and Truman and Johnson. And then when he got into Johnson... Well, Democrats. Yeah, he's a big Democrat. Okay. He came from Columbia. He's Jewish. 
<coughs> and he, he wrote on, on all of the Democratic press. He didn't have any use for any Republican. But he had to do this Kissinger, uh, he had to do this Kissinger-Nixon relationship because that's where the balance of power went. Oh, and after he, after he did the Johnson biography, he says, well, how am I going to handle this? And so he had this odd book called, the odd, well, he had this book, Odd Couple. It wasn't the presidency of Nixon because he didn't want to glorify just that Nixon. relationship? Yeah he, yeah, he thinks Nixon was corrupt, but he, he thinks that Kissinger was corrupt. But well, I'd Nixon, have to agree with him on both counts. Yeah, but Nick, uh, Kissing, uh, Dalek is Jewish, and he says, yeah, he's corrupt on the side of the Jews. There's still that Jewish identity there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you think that influence? I think that influences it? every biographer. Mm -hmm. Oh, you think the biographer, think, you think th it painted Dalek's I, view? I think. Not that Kissinger's. It, well, it, uh, Kissinger's Jewish. Yeah. Israel is I mean. a Jewish state. Right. Now, Do you think Kissinger is a Zionist? No, because he's okay. an American Jew. He was born in Germany. Yeah. But and you think he believes in Zionism? No, he doesn't it. believe in Zionism. He believes as a second string that he has to preserve the territorial integrity of Israel as long as possible. I he see. doesn't want to see Israel sink. Right. Okay. But he can't be too brazen. He can't be Netanyahu. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> he has to be an American first. Okay. And he's saying, okay, for Israel to survive, he says it the same way to Johnson. He says to Johnson, you have to get out of Indo China just to survive because Beijing and Moscow have more power and you can't bog down on it. Well, he says to Israel, you can't keep occupying the Sinai because there are 99 million Egyptians and you're a country of 2 million. Well, you've got to get out of the Sinai. You've got to pay a little price to have peace after mm -hmm. that uh, Yom Kippur war breaks out. In 67. Yeah, and, and Nixon, uh, uh, Kissinger played both sides. He gave money to, Sodom, uh, to, to uh, the Israelis, but he gave money to Sadat. And the reason why he gave the money to Sadat, he says, we want to get the Soviet weapons out of Egypt. I and see, we'll give yeah. you American weapons. And if you have American weapons, you can have a standoff with Israel. And Israel won't run over you next time. So that Iraq war was a stalemate. And Kissinger had the balance of, of, of forces. He said to Israel, we will resupply you if you give up the Sinai. And he says to Sadat, you, if you, we'll give you arms if you go to Tel Aviv and you go and recognize the state of Israel. And then that breaks the Arab League. It makes, mm -hmm. he, he, he separates. So he drove a wedge. He drove a wedge between China and the Soviet Union and he drove a wedge between Egypt and the other Arab states. Which is the whole purpose Which is of the, the balance of, of the power. Balance of, right. yeah, that's the game. Yeah, you have to be loyal to the state and the geography. And then religion, well, you can defend your religion as, as much as possible. Mm -hmm. So he's not going to sabotage Israel, but he's just saying to the Israelis, you've got to play it a little cool. You can't win. Now, I think that Kissinger right now supports Obama and says to Obama, well, you've got to make a deal with Iran. The, Iran, because nuclear weapons. See, yeah. uh, well, it's an arms deal. Yeah, I mean, right. it's, not, words, it's not some sort of trade pact. It's yeah, an arms deal. Yeah, well, so, so that's, the, that's the cleverness of, of, of yeah. Kissinger. The balance of power means you sacrifice. Oh, I have no doubt that he's, yeah. he's right. clever. clever. I and just think he's immoral. He's immoral from... Your religion. Now, what is your religion? I don't follow that exactly. My re well. Where do you get your morality from? Where I get my morality from Western philosophy, Socrates, Confucius, uh, literature, Buddhism. Well, that, well, that's all a big all debate, over the place. isn't it? That's a that's a big debate. Yeah, I, I mean, you <laughs> could call. I would call myself a pantheist, which Richard Dawkins just calls sexed up atheism. 
but um, yeah. But you I see, would, uh, here is here is my criticism of that. Of pantheism. Here's my criticism of your philosophy. Plato can be a philosopher. Uh, Confucius can be a philosopher. But a philosopher sits in the ivory tower. Now, the Jewish civilization is 2,000 years old. The Christian civilization is 2,000 years old. The Muslim civilization is 1,500 years old. Those civilizations are going to survive over many centuries. Because the average 18-year-old, no matter whether he's born in China or Iraq or whether he's born in Israel, can't understand philosophy unless he has the leisure time, like Jefferson, to mm -hmm. sit in a library and read philosophy. Yeah. So pantheism doesn't have a mass following. Oh, no. Well, I wouldn't want to... I, wouldn't, I, I, okay. don't care, I don't care for mass followings anyway. Okay, well, you That's can be no a, matter to me. You can be a journalist as long as you... But I've been much more... My morality has been much more informed by the works of Plato and Spinoza and Confucius but, than it has any other of the, the monotheistic religions. Well, where do you get the Ten Commandments from? Who invented Thou Shalt Not Kill? Who invented... Well, I, I can't think of any society where it's where murder okay. or perjury is acceptable. Okay. I don't think that we derive that from monotheism, even in Hellenism. All right, well, I'm not concerned acceptable. about monotheism. I think that's a minor point. Well, that's, well, we're getting a little sidetracked, but... Right, but I'm just saying... You're talking about the civilizations that these... I am the saying, three major I am monotheistic saying, religions saying, have created. I am saying that... If and that's all good and well, but to I'm me it saying, hasn't been more. I'm just saying whether you're an American or whether you're a German or whether you're an Israeli, the decision to go to war or the decision to arrest a criminal, there has to be a standard of right and wrong. Sure. Okay. Yeah, well, I agree. Okay. Now, but I think those standards are exi were existent before the monotheistic religions, and they'll continue to well, be. Well, why did Greek civilization disappear? The Greek civilization no longer exists. Who killed it? Well, Rome overtook it through force. Sure. Okay. But then they adopted most of their their. And did Rome gods survive? Their did, philosophies. did Rome survive? Yeah, but I would argue that that's all because of. Uh, Constantine's uh, adoption of Christianity. I put that I'm, as I'm the downfall of Rome. But you could you can tell a lot about a person about what they believe caused the downfall of the Roman Empire and right. how that relates to the, their personality. There's a lot of different arguments for the downfall of the Roman Empire. I'm more I lean toward the idea that uh, well, let me just put it this way: I wish that the Emperor Julian would have lived. Why? And what? Have, because I think that he had the right idea. What's the right idea? Uh, well, at the time, the right <laughs> idea would have been to to stop the uh, the manipulation of the masses through the use of Christianity well, by the leaders of the Roman Empire. What did Nero do before Empire. Christianity? Was he manipulating the masses? Uh, well, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. But that's a power grab to me. Okay, there have been, what, a dozen empires. If you go to Toynbee, there were 21 civilizations. The Hittites disappeared, the Cambodians disappeared, the Aztecs disappeared, but there are five... Well, our empire, the, the American world, empire world world disappears The Americans well. only have a culture. The Americans have been around for 150 years. They're nothing. Yeah. Forget about America. But... There are five civilizations which are viable today. Christian civilization, Jewish civilization, Muslim civilization, Chinese civilization. Now, Chinese, they're in chaos. Part Confucian, part Taoist, part Maoist. The Chinese themselves don't know where they're going. 
If you What's talk the to fifth? The Hindus, Hinduism. are the oldest civilization of it's all. The oldest religion, and they are polytheistic. And the only reason why they survive is because they're isolated to the subcontinent. They've never tried to become a world religion. The Hindus have in common with the Jews. We don't believe in conversion. Well, the Hindus who come to England, and we've got two minutes late, we've got two minutes to go, we're going to have to continue this, but the Hindus who come to, to England or America soon become either secularists or vague Christians, or when they intermarry, they don't, they don't convert people to Hinduism, that's what I'm saying. They don't have a long-term survival. Okay, we have to stop now, but all I want to conclude is that we're talking about the Iraqi-Iranian war. It was a very short-term affair, and the United States under Ronald Reagan was playing an ideological game of using anti-communism to exploit that war. Now you have a couple of... Oh, well, I think that, that was a good summary of what of the Iran-Iraq war. I think that the United States was playing both sides okay. um, and uh, driving a wedge. Right. And I think that personal philosophy is fine, and I think that Carl Sagan can be an atheist as long as he talks about the stratosphere in a classroom. Well, I think he would have called himself a pantheist. I don't care what he calls himself. Einstein, too, would have been a pantheist. Well, I don't care what they call themselves. I am a person who lives for American society. And the American society has to balance ideas. Philosophy is important. I think that every college student should have a course in philosophy. Mm -hmm. But they also need politics and economics and the military. Absolutely. For survival. Absolutely. And if you're going to go to war, there has to be a justification for killing young men. That's I've, the problem of... I think war is... Man's most barbaric invention. Well, you and I agree on that. Thank you for having me, Professor. Okay, good.